Is someone going to introduce me? Um, I'm not a moderator. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm probably supposed to moderate, but I will. It's Scott Brown. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, I, I can I can introduce myself. Many, many yeah. So we really appreciate it. So um, here's your introduction, Scott Brown. Go for it. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, you're going to want to go ahead and click on the the video screen up in the upper right hand corner and click on that little uh, group of people because that is where my presentation is going to come in. Uh, and here we go. Once you're, once you're at full screen, you still can go to the very top of the screen and pull down uh, the Q&A stuff. So anyhow, we're going to get started. We're going to talk about ADAS Perception Systems. Uh, the title of the course is Vi Visualization for Education. Uh, I have uh, partnered with AES Wave, and uh, when they sell equipment, um, they're providing some training opportunities, and we actually set up a training center in my shop in uh, Southern California here. I'm about uh, 35 miles east of LA uh, in Claremont. So the topics we're going to talk about today, uh, perception systems, uh, some expectations versus reality, uh, cameras, radar, ultrasonics, and then if we have enough time, we're going to go to a case study. So if we look at the, the commercial information that's out there today, it, uh, there's two stories being told. And it's very frustrating um, to see that the OEMs want, you know, they, they want to basically describe how the, the limitations are and then what they actually advertise. And we're going to mute some more people here. There we go. Yeah, if you come in the room, if somebody comes in, please mute, mute themselves. Uh, so if we look at, this is a screenshot from a commercial. This is Nissan. Um, I'm not really picking on Nissan, but this is one that uh, I had an early experience with uh, going to a training session. And if you look at the fine print down there, it says ProPilot Assist cannot prevent collisions. It's the driver's responsibility to be in control of the vehicle at all times. Always monitor traffic conditions and keep both hands on the steering wheel. Okay, key point. System operates only when lane markings are detected. Uh, does not function in all weather, traffic, road conditions. System has limited control capabilities and the driver may need to steer, brake, or accelerate at any time to maintain safety. See owner's manual for info. This, these are critical words because when service technicians are interacting with these vehicles and, and uh, doing service, they need to make sure that when they're done with the vehicle, it's put back in service properly. Uh, and they're, they're not affecting um, any of these systems or causing any, any uh, deficiencies. But these systems are deficient. And it's going to be a while before we see some really rock solid stuff. Um, and I'll, I've got some demonstrations here. So here is a, here's another Nissan commercial I just filmed with my phone of the TV. And watch what happens here. And pay attention to the ladies' hands uh, on the steering wheel. So she pushes a button there, and the road magically opens up, okay? But watch her hands. She's pulling her hands off the wheel. They're, they're telling you that, you know, it's okay to pull your hands off the wheel, but that is not, that is not really what, uh, what should be happening. So I'll take it to the other extreme, and I was in uh, Nick Goodnight's uh, presentation this morning, and he was talking about uh, Tesla Tesla is ahead of the curve. Uh, I drive a Tesla. This is me in my car. But what I want you to pay attention to here, uh, this will stop and, and animate a couple of things here, but the, the Tesla, do you see the animated vehicle and the vehicle in front of me? You're going to see a, a stop line um, animated across the screen because it's going to detect these two light, these traffic control lights up here on the, uh, the overcross there. And those are legacy traffic control. They're not even used anymore. And they've been, been, out, of, uh, been out of commission for, for quite some time. And uh, so we're gonna play this. And you see the lights are starting to be animated on the driver's screen there. 
and this, the line, and that, that was a normal event. Now you'll see the next one, depending on the time of day, you see the light that flashed there, a little yellow light. Nothing really happened. Then the next event here, it's going to get a false positive. It's gotten two false positives, and, it, and it's going to decelerate slightly. Now I've, I haven't captured this on film yet, but it has been very dramatic at times. And uh, what's interesting here is I've been able to push the, uh, there's a button you can push for a bug report. I filed multiple bug reports. Well, that stop line is no longer showing up in the, uh, uh, in the display anymore. And I haven't had this slowdown experience happen uh, anymore. So what are we talking about on these vehicles? You know, we're interacting with um, various things that may affect the fusion of, of data that the system is using. We've got radar, camera, ultrasonics, but over on the, the right there, you've got wheel speed sensors, steering angle sensors, GPS sensors, um, these things that we may be interacting with, and they're, they're all relied upon to, to help with the vehicle's perception systems. This is a uh, this is some text out of a 2020 Lexus uh, driver's uh, owner's manual, um, and it's basically a disclaimer about how their uh, collision avoidance um, or pedestrian detection system and the bullet points. If a pedestrian is is of the riding height or a bicyclist ahead uh, is shorter than 3.2 feet or taller than six and a half feet, it may not work. Um, if a pedestrian bicyclist is wearing an oversight clothing, a raincoat or whatever, um, they may not be uh, picked up by the perception system. So um, if the wheels are misaligned, if the radar sensor or the front camera is misaligned. So there's a lot of things at play here that could um, uh, contribute to a deficient um, operating system. One of, one of, of uh, the things that, that is a good reference here is the SAE J3016. That is the um, SAE's uh, uh, definition of the driving automation. There's six different levels. It goes from level zero to level five. Uh, but two key points here, the dynamic driving task. Um, if you go to SAE, uh, you don't have to buy this. You can actually download the document, but you do have to have a membership. Uh, a lot of really good information there, and I think that it's, uh, it's important that we understand where these vehicles uh, stand and, and where their capabilities are, because we're going to have these vehicles rolling through these different levels populating the fleet, and these vehicles, you know, the average age of that vehicle is 12, 12 years. Here in California, Southern California especially, in my workshop, we're seeing 40 decades of, of vehicles all the time. And so these vehicles moving forward, they're gonna be in the fleet and uh, gonna require service and we're gonna to need to be able to deliver that proper service. And then the that operational design domain, this is where these things are, what the capabilities are. Uh, regardless of what the marketing says, it's, it's the actual capabilities of that particular system as it was put into service. So let's talk about forward facing cameras and uh, what they're doing. Um, this is camera, the camera vision systems. Uh, there's a lot of magic that is, uh, that is happening with these perception systems. And the cameras can have uh, specific filters applied to them or specific techniques to help them pick up other cues, other, other visual cues, uh, things that we can't see with our human eye. So they pick up text, there's lines, and then there's other. And you look at this road sign here, and this is up in Michigan. And this is a test corridor. That sign there says left lane close one mile, but to the camera system, with special filters applied, it can see that 2D barcode that's in the middle of that screen, and that that of course carries a lot more information. You know, it tells that that computer, hey, the left lane is closed in one mile. Um, now the car has to decide: am I in the left lane? Now I need to make a decision and uh, and take action. Uh, almost every camera today is uh, using what's what's called high dynamic range or HDR, and this is a uh, this is a representation of what HDR happens, and this is happening in video. So it's taking um, you see the top left picture there is uh, overexposed. This is a normal exposure, and then an underexposed, and then it blends all that data together to give you a high dynamic range picture so that it has the most uh, capability that it can pick up. 
And um, so this is this is good for technicians to understand how these cameras are seeing because they're they're not able to we're not able to see everything that they're seeing, and that's the the reason for this this class. Um, this is another representation of the the range, uh, the the range of luminance here uh, on the left. The standard range, if you could see that scale, it goes from uh, zero, uh, minus 20 to 120. And this is HDR, and it's going from zero to 10,000. So quite a bit of gradient there um, to help with these uh, visual uh, perception systems. So some of the tasks that take place inside the camera or inside these systems, they're applying certain filters and performing certain routines. And this is an example of uh, what's called semantic segmentation. So it's identifying um, different areas and then it's colorizing them. So in this case here, that, that purple, it's, it's identifying the drivable space. Um, it's identifying uh, people, uh, other vehicles, vegetation, and uh, blue sky. And we're gonna see some demos of this here in a second. So you can also, to add to some more visuals, um, you can go out on the internet. There's a lot of data out there. Um, there is a particular uh, person that I follow uh, on Twitter, and he is a white hat hacker, um, and he's he's into Teslas. And so this is him. This is his work. He's actually uh, taken the data that that the computer is actually recording, and then he's able to take all of the vision data and then re reassemble it and. Um, and add the visualizations. But this is, uh, it's showing the green drivable space, uh, the lane lines, the other vehicles. Uh, it's identifying where the, the vehicle is located. And so here is a, um, here's a vehicle that he actually pulled data out of uh, over in Europe. But I'm gonna play this little video and you're gonna see how this system is identifying uh, where the vehicle's at. You can see here that the uh, You'll, you'll see pedestrians over on the right side in that parkway in between those trees. You're going to see people being identified in real time. Right there. Pretty incredible. So these visual indicators, you know, let you, let you know that there's a lot of activity going on inside these, uh, these systems. And they're, they're uh, tasked with a pretty high order of, uh, of work. This is another one. Um, this guy, this is that same guy, uh, and and he's given me permission to use his data. Um, and watch what happens here. This thing, as it's going to drive, it's going to identify a vehicle and what type of vehicle it is. Oh, parked in the par uh, right. Uh, there's a parking lot over here. Um, there's a square box around it. Well, as it rolls forward here, it's saying minivan, and it's showing the distance to the minivan. Do you see the little dots floating around the screen? Those are radar returns. So there, this is sensor fusion. This is an example of how the sensor imagery is pulled all together and uh, is helping uh, the vehicle perception system see um, what's going on. So here is some of the tools that uh, we have uh, deployed. Uh, this is in my workshop and I, I don't know, some of you may have seen this video that I uh, published last December, but if you go out on, on uh, YouTube and at the end of this uh, presentation, um, I'll, I'll give you guys a link to the deck and the deck, the last two slides have links to the uh, to this video. But if you search YouTube for uh, NVIDIA uh, CNN uh, object detection and put my name in there, you'll find this video. But this is gonna give you a little example of some sensor fusion because I've got a, a radar simulator down here in the lower right. And then the camera view that we're looking through, this is a an NVIDIA um, Jetson Nano development box that I'm gonna talk about here, that you can run these, you can run this uh, object detection and classification system yourself and actually run experiments uh, so that your students can can see what's, uh, what's going on. So we're gonna just play this a little bit. There's no, there's no audio here. But you'll see me come in with roll in with a bike, and you see it identifying the bike and, and myself. And then um, I'm going to ride the bike around 
and you'll see the tracking of the um, my location on the the radar um, area and you'll see me come around the car and then pass through pretty cool and then uh, you see I've got two trihedrals there those are the radar reflectors used on some vehicles for uh, for calibration and you can see where they're actually set up on the uh, on the screen so pretty cool stuff this is another video um, again using the uh, the Nvidia um, uh, box and this is this is what this box looks like this is it this little box here is just a little computer and it has a I had to buy a camera that that attaches to it and a fan and a little case and you can download code you've got to get a github account download some code and you can run it uh, but this is running semantic segmentation so the big panel in the center we were seeing the overlay uh, with the video but over on the right hand side you're seeing um, the blobs of data but it's it's this is how the computer is interpreting what's going on and where these things are located so we're just going to play this so this is semantic and we're we're in a parking garage and you see the cars moving through there so it's uh it's a little odd so now this is the object detection classification you see the street lights are actually being um, identified cars the trucks traffic lights and so on pretty pretty interesting stuff here and this is the, the stuff that you can run um, with the uh, with the uh, Nvidia box So we got somebody that rose raised their hand. Let's see. Rick, you had a question? No, I'm sorry. I looked up on Okay. All right, no problem. We'll uh, give you a demerit later on and uh, make you stand in the corner, okay? Uh, so here's the kit. Um, the uh, Jetson Nano Developer Kit. You can go out there. It's the the actual box that that board itself right there is uh, about a hundred dollars or a hundred and ten dollars, but uh, when you add in uh, all the other things that I added on the, um, um, you know, when you add the, the little assembly box and the uh, the camera and a fan, and then you're going to need to get a memory card. This this thing actually boots and runs off of a small micro SD card. Uh, and you can run these projects. They have uh, self-explanatory projects that you can run. Um, and uh, so that, that might be an experiment um, in itself for these students to understand a little bit more about how the computer and perception systems are, are working. So stereo vision. This is another um, interesting uh, item uh you know vol uh, uh sorry uh, subaru and uh now you've got some mercedes and bmw they're using stereo cameras and the stereo cameras basically help um with depth uh, it adds a, a magnitude of of depth perception and i'm using a um a device it's called a z2 z-e-d and um you can buy this this device and you can actually run software you will have to have a computer that has a gpu on it so the, you know the nvidia box ha that's what nvidia is uh, famous for the gpus because the gpus are taking the computing power above and beyond what the cpus can actually um, deliver to the system so gpus are are super powerful and especially when we're dealing with graphics but uh, if you have a computer that has the right uh, video card and you buy this, uh, this um, Z2 device, and I've got a live demo here that we're gonna go through in a second, um, you can do some of the same, same stuff and, and show your student what's going, students what's going on here. So if we look at this screen here, top left, we're looking at just uh, you know, the, the regular human view. The lower left, this is uh, one form of some filtering that's being applied to the scene to help it define uh, objects and, and places and, and distances and so on. 
And then over on the right, we're actually seeing what the computer is doing. It's creating a live uh, 3D point cloud of the scene um, with distances and so on in real time. It's, it's absolutely amazing. So we've got a couple of demos here that I want to show you. And I'm going to switch over to this, uh, this, you should be able to see that. I'm going to take myself off the screen there. Okay. So we are looking at a, uh, an actual recording. This is a recording that I did in my, my, uh, my workshop. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to now just connect to the camera and look at a live view. So you'll see my big messy office here. All right, so we are now looking at a, um, a live picture of um, looking out the side of my office uh, from my desk here. And a couple of things to point out is um, I've got two trihedrals in here, and it may be hard to see them, but I'm, I'm moving my mouse here. I've got a large trihedral, um, if you're looking at the upper left uh, pane got a large trihedral there and I've got the uh, smaller Toyota trihedral right here and then lower left we're looking at um, what's called a depth uh, measurement um, the I'm going to switch the view here and this is going to give a what's called a confidence view so we're adding different filtering techniques to the camera uh, to determine for, to help the system understand you know how how and where things are located and then over here on the right, we're actually looking at what the camera looks like. So this, this little black uh, guy right there, that's, that's the actual camera. And we're seeing a projected frame from the left view of the camera. Okay. And we're looking at, uh, at my office. So I can actually zoom into this. And this might struggle a little bit because there's a lot of video going on here. Okay. So I'm zooming into my office here a little bit, okay. But here's the cool thing. So I can go to this top left screen right here and I can move my mouse over the center of that trihedral right there and I'm gonna click once, okay. It just drew a, a little laser measurement from the camera and I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so you can see it. And do you see the little laser measurement right there? So it just ran a, a measurement there, and you cannot see this on the screen here. I'm going to have to look at this. It says that that's about 3.2 meters away, okay? And then I can go measure this one and make a note of that because we're going to look at a radar scene, a live scene of this, and I've got both the radar and the camera on the same plane. So 3.2 meters, and then we're looking at the larger, or I'm sorry, the smaller trihedral there. And that one is about 1.8 or so. Let's see here. Yeah, about 1.8, uh, 1.8 meters to that uh, to that area. And we can we can zoom in some more here. And I'm actually in that scene. And you can actually look at the scene going backwards. I mean, this is uh, this is pretty fascinating stuff. Um, I mean, it it draw it piques my interest, and I think a young student would probably. Uh, like to see some of this stuff as well but uh, I'll let you you guys be the judge of that <clears throat> all right hey, so Scott, yes you, you mentioned the word trihedral trihedral yes what does that mean? a trihedral is the uh, the radar reflector that is being used um, to to concentrate a signal and it's made up of uh, three isosceles triangles or it's actually it's a box it's a square box that's cut and it's set at a certain distance and height um, and center usually center line of the vehicle and it reflects a signal backwards and we'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to the uh, to the radar segment so this is a I'm running a little demo here of a video showing me driving the car with this thing. I mounted it in the car so I could see what's going on with it. And you'll see I'm approaching that car and we're gonna stop here. And I created a, a little video here to show you how the scene looks 
So see, I'm zooming in on the right side there of the vehicle. I'm, I'm actually, you know, surrounding myself uh, outside the vehicle. And then as you rotate this around, look at that, look at that scene. It's actually doing this in real time. This is, this is pretty, uh, pretty cool stuff. And this is the Z2. So you can go out there, you can buy that from Stereo Labs. And I uh, can't remember exactly how much that was. I think it was, geez, I think it was four or 500 bucks. I, I can't remember, but uh, it's a pretty cool, um, pretty cool tool to run experiments with. And this is just uh, the beginning of this stuff. There's, there, there's a lot more stuff that you can run similar to the object detection and classification stuff that, uh, that I showed uh, earlier. So ad additionally in the um, service information, and this is, this is right out of all data and all data has, you know, like the other ones, they have a lot of uh, OEM service information, but there is training information within the service information, just depending on who the manufacturer is. Uh, but they provide a lot of really good um, description on how, you know, where the camera's looking, where the horizon is, where the pitch is. But uh, one thing of caution is that I have seen this multiple times is that when you see the um, measurement, see they're showing you 63 millimeters and then they're showing you the conversion in one inch. Well, 63 millimeters is not one inch. So um, it's, it's probably 25 millimeters, I'm guessing, because 63 millimeters seems like a pretty large distance. But you know, when you're looking at this service information, make sure your technicians are questioning everything they're reading. Um, to make sure that it makes sense. Um, here's another uh, interesting uh, piece of information. This is talking about the vanishing point, okay? And this is, uh, this is good information to know because a lot of these systems, when you go in to calibrate the vehicle, you are actually, um, you know, you're establishing a center line of that vehicle, you're putting a target, you're making sure the vehicle's loaded correctly, right? You know, the, the, and the alignment's correct and all that. And then you're hitting a button to give it a calibration point, a set point. These vehicles are dynamically recalibrating or re-indexing themselves. And this explains what it's doing. Um, it's looking at what's called the vanishing point. So it takes the, the, the lane lines and as they go out into the distance and they, where they intersect, and it looks at the stored vanishing point versus the one that it's sensing right now, and it makes a determination on whether or not it needs to update that information. So, this is why it's good to start studying the service, inf or I'm sorry, the service data that's coming off the vehicle. A lot of the manufacturers they provide minimal data stream for the end user. Uh, I, I really wish they would give us a lot more data, and, and hopefully that'll come in the future. But this is going to help us understand. Um, you know, as that vehicle ages and how, as it's behaving on what to no look for, what are the norms and, uh, and so on. So this is just a zoomed in picture of that uh, vanishing point. And it talks about, you know, how it stores it and, um, and how the computer is using it. This is another, uh, this is something I found on the internet that, that start, tries to explain, you know, it's trying to paint a 3D space onto a one-dimensional plane and uh, and trying to illustrate where, where things are happening. But that's that explains a little bit more about what that vanishing point's all about. Uh, another really good source of, uh, of information is uh, data sheets. Um, there's a lot of data sheets out there on different sensors. And um, if you go out and find, um, find some of these sheets, they have some really interesting uh, pieces here. They talk about what the optics are, um, what the field of view is, what the aperture of the camera is. You see here that it's uh, the imager resolution is 2.6 megapixels. It is HDR and it's 2048 by 1280 pixels. So that's greater than high definition television, which is 1920 by 1080. Um, talks about how many frames per second. Um, and then down here at the bottom, hardware accelerator, it's a DNN. So that's a deep neural network, uh, classifier, optical flow, um, you know, different engines. And this is where the manufacturers, you know, I'd say they put their, their calibration system um, out into the marketplace. And these, if they've got a closed loop system, similar to what Tesla does, they're, they're collecting data and they're analyzing it. 
And when they get it wrong or when they find they need to fine tune it, they can continue to fine tune and then upload um, new, uh, new firmware to the system to make it work better. So when we do calibration, um, we're essentially we're doing two things. We're doing what's called an intrinsic um, correction and an extrinsic correction. And the intrinsic is basically all the internal camera um, metrics, uh, you know, the focal length, the lens distortion, because all the lenses, you know, they have a, uh, um, they're convex or, or concave, and they do distort the lines, right? And then we also do have aperture and sensor. And so if they can do some correction with a uh, calibration um, image, then they can digitally transform that and, and make a correction for that. And then when we do an external, we're looking for the, uh, or the extrinsic is external, and then how the sensor relates to the, to the rest of the world. So we're inputting um, the vehicle height and um, it's, uh, it's, you know, where it's located it's versus the center line of the vehicle, how far that target is away, where the target height is, and, and so on. And so this is why we have these, uh, these fixed targets that we need to use. Now, not all manufacturers require you to use a, a fixed target. Um, a lot of the domestics typically are uh, what's called a dynamic, and they basically uh, will just have you set the car up on a level surface, make sure it's all prepped, and then you're just going to go into the scan tool and hit a button to uh, put it into a dynamic drive mode or dynamic calibration, and then you're instructed to drive it around in a rich target environment, and it will do its, uh, do its thing um, dynamically, which is a, a huge reduction on labor. Um, however, some manufacturers uh, still require you to do a, um, uh, a fixed uh, uh, static type calibration. And so let's look at the targets here. So this is a, an ADAS target that I took a picture of and I purposely, I pulled it into a um, photo uh, application, light, light uh, room, and I inputted a different camera lens calibration to show you the distortion here. So you can see that there's a, a curved, um, you can see that the, the horizontal lines that I've uh, placed in there, and you can clearly see that there is a, a curve to it, right? And so what the camera will do is it will see if it can correct that transformation internally and, and, make, and make up for that. And so that's why we have these high uh, contrast uh, targets. And there it is uh, after it's been put back to its, uh, the, the original uh, calibration with the right lens uh, in my photo program. So this is uh, typically the view. This is a view of a... Um, of a calibration uh, target setup for, uh, I, I can't remember what ma vehicle manufacturer, but uh, you've got uh, two targets now that are set up uh, to help with that uh, calibration. But here's the problem, um, and I, I've run into this multiple times, and that is that the technician, when they run into a problem, so say that you set everything up perfectly, you hit that button, and it says, oh, it, it has an error. It doesn't want to, it says can't calibrate. Now what do you do? You go back and you double, triple check all your measurements and everything is fine. And then you hit that button again and it keeps failing. So now the technician needs to go into uh, investigation mode and uh, try to figure out what in the heck could be happening with this, uh, with this system. Why is it not working properly? And so here is an example of a... Um, of a calibration um, event uh, or a calibration uh, situation that I, I discovered while I was doing some investigating. And I'm going to pull this up on my other computer so we can look at the actual live data. Bear with me one second. It is 14. Okay. So we're going to look at, um, we're, we're back in this Z uh, camera here, and it's actually playing a recording. So I'm going to pause it. And so at the top left, of course, we're looking at a regular view. The lower left, we're looking at um, what's called a confidence 
level and then we can go look at the depth uh, perception um, if I can select it there it is so the reason that they they are they are picking up these high contrast targets is that so they they can draw these fine lines and interpret what uh, where, where everything's at and that's just how it does its transformation correction uh, during the intrinsic and the extrinsic um, situation but what's happening is that this this is a properly lit scene okay and I'm gonna scrub forward on this video recording and you're gonna see what happens when I just simply turn on another bank of lights in my shop and I'm gonna scrub this forward here and you're gonna see the top half of the target go away see that so the lights are now on if you took a look at the top left you don't really see a whole lot of difference um, you know there's there's a little bit of reflection here but because of the filters that are being applied to the the system for it to go into that mode usually when you're in calibration there's other things that are happening so it goes into this mode and it's trying to identify where these circles and these squares and these marks are and it, it can't see it like in this case then it's going to fail and um, if you look in service information, some manufacturers, especially Toyota, they have a whole, um, a whole big article on um, proper lighting, proper scene lighting, how to prevent this from actually happening. But a lot of guys don't, they don't see it. I mean, they, they've they've illustrated some of it, but they don't, they're not illustrating it like this um, to show what the deficiencies actually do, and that you just can't see it with your eyes. Okay. So we'll go back here. And uh, so do we have any questions? Um, maybe I'll stop for questions here. We do have a hand raised, Tom. Tom, you had your hand raised? Uh, I did, this was a while ago. Okay. That is correct. Okay, that's what I, I just want to double check. That's the stereo camera created that 3D image. Is that part of that software? It comes with that? Is that software? Yeah, yeah, it comes, the software comes with it. Um, you need to have it running on a pretty powerful machine. It's, it needs to have a good um, graphics uh, chip that has the GPU. And, and if you go to the Zed uh, website, you can read about what the requirements are. But uh, it is pretty resource intensive. Um, in fact, when I'm running it, like for this presentation, I just had it running, and I mean, it's it's really taxing the the computer. There's a lot going on there. Is it like a four or eight megs of or gigs of, of memory on that video card? Uh, you know, I think I think I have eight gigs on this one. Okay. But it but it's the GPU. That's the the part that really makes the makes this actually work. Uh, the okay. GPU is the part that's going to drive the the three dimensional. Um, view and when you're looking at it on the computer itself, it's uh, it's a lot better than me showing it here in this uh, in this uh, class here. Okay. And you had another question. I see. No, okay, I saw two next to your hands there. So, um, and then Rick Rick is uh, that's an old uh, mistake question. Okay. All right. Um, well, we'll move on to radar sensors here and uh, talk about these for a little bit. Um, this is a, we're looking at a picture of a radar sensor. Uh, and this is something you may want to reach out to some of your collision shops and see if you can get some old pieces and take these things apart because they are pretty interesting. Um, I've just done a, a bunch of reading and, and uh, studying on how these sensors actually work, um, you know, and increasing my knowledge on on, on what they're doing here, but if we look at this uh, this array, these, these two these two rows here, these pair of rows, these are the transmitters. So these are outbounding, um, they call them chirps, radar chirps. And they're doing this at about 77 to 80 billion times a second, okay? And what they do is they, they outbound them and then they reflect back and then they get caught by these these receivers down here. 
And you'll notice on the receivers going up and down from the center, they get smaller. The pads are smaller. And then uh, these are specifically, they, they're at specific distances from each other. And you'll see these two transmitters, these, this pair are located adjacent to each other at a specific distance, and then these are further away from each other. And so this is how it, it triangulates um, where it's at. And then the up and down part, of course, is gonna help it gather some information about the elevation from the, the plane of that sensor. So it is bouncing things off uh, an object out there and receiving them back. And this is how it, it's interpreting the distance um, and it's through what's called an incidence angle. And there's a lot of literature out there from uh, different radar manufacturers that, that go into details on how to, how to interpret some of this stuff. But it's, um, um, I think it's some good foundational knowledge to have some, some idea of what they, they actually are doing to accomplish their tasks. But the other thing to really be aware of is that this is a highly delicate piece. This is a wafer here. And most uh, devices, they say right on the, the package, it says, do not drop, right? So if they, this car gets in a collision and it has any kind of impact, that's the equivalent of a do not drop, right? And those things should be scrapped. Uh, I've seen, you know, I've had cars come in for calibration that have come from a collision center and you know the front bumper got smacked or whatever, and we've had problems. You know, I, I look at the radar sensor and I go, it's the original one. I go, you need to sell a new one and sell that to the, the insurance company because that uh, these things do not uh, put up with any any type of uh, shock. Um, so very important. So how does the radar see? Again, this is a data sheet I pulled from Continental on uh, on on one of their sensors. And it gives you some idea. This is a sensor that actually has dual mode to it. So it's a long range and a medium range um, sensor. And they have different focal lengths, right? So they can, they can look at a wide view, but at a shorter distance. And then they've got a long view for a longer, longer distance. And then this picture right here, this is showing um, the, the location of this particular radar sensor. And this is off of a Lincoln, uh, Lincoln Continental. You have to actually have the radar bumper off to adjust this sensor. So um, this is actually using a kind of an elaborate setup with a with a laser pointing back and it's reflecting back and it's uh, pushing the uh, we're we're making sure that it's dead center and all that. Uh, if you look at the Ford literature, um, you know this is the aftermarket instruction. Well, the Ford literature just shows a simple uh, level. You just put a level up against the the face of the thing and adjust it. And then you put it into the dynamic uh, drive mode and then you take it out and, and finish that calibration. So this is another visual um, piece here that I've got. Um, I've got a little board that is a demo board and we can actually set up different views so that we can understand a little bit more about how the radar sensor looks or, or how, it, how it sees or how it perceives the world around us. So, We've got an XY plot here, and so it's showing uh, from the center of the plane of the radar out, and it's showing where the objects are being detected. You can actually move your mouse over and actually get data um, data off of that. So it's looking, that's its uh, XY plot scatter. And then over on the right, we have what's called a range profile. So it's showing how much energy is being returned from the radar sensor here. And then this uh, is, is also giving us distance here along this, uh, this axis here. And then over on the right, we have what's called a heat map. Um, so the engineers, when the engineers are setting up these devices, they have a, an array of tools that they can use um, to, to run you know, software to uh, identify where these things are actually located um, out on the, on the vehicle. So we're gonna go over to my, um, my other computer, okay, and we're gonna look at the live uh, demo of this radar sensor. Um, this radar sensor is just sitting on my desk and it's looking out um, in the same view that we, we saw earlier with the camera. So let's, uh, we go back to the live camera feed. There's our live feed. 
and I'm going to put my measurement back out here on that trihedral there and it's showing me that it's about 3. Point, uh, so 3.2 meters okay so we're looking at the XY scatter plot and the the one that I just pointed to on the screen is actually dead center and this is where it's at right there and uh, as I mouse over that do you see it's showing zero degrees the first uh, first metric there is zero and then to the right of that is in um, meters so it's 3.27 uh, meters away from the center of that thing so basically both the camera and the radar are lining up and um, the uh, that this is this is pretty cool I mean you see what Subaru has done they've got adaptive cruise control automated emergency braking and they're accomplishing all of that without the use of a radar sensor the only radar sensors on a Subaru are at the back of the car for the uh, uh, for the blind spot uh, detection so they're able to accomplish this without that other expensive radar sensor by using you know high resolution graphics and uh, triangulation um, so we've got a couple questions here um, from Isabel. Is this something to introduce to an advanced electrical class? And is it safe to clean with Clorox or alcohol for COVID uh, blended courses? So what I've got set up, um, yeah, I, it, it's pretty robust. Yeah, you can just use a, uh, the Clorox wipes and uh, wipe this stuff down. Um, the, the radar board is actually just a, a, a board and it has a little aluminum, a um, couple of aluminum brackets on it. Uh, in a minute, I'll pull it in front of the camera so you guys can see it. Um, so yeah, you could probably just, just wipe that stuff off, but um, the, um, but would you, and then there's another question here, let's see. Okay, which, which level? I'm not sure where you would want to introduce this, um, but, uh, You'll, you'll have to decide. I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a traditional teacher. So, um, and then we've got enough. I've been cleaning circuit boards, DMM with alcohol and Clorox. Um, yeah, Noah. I mean, you can spray down the thing with a electrical cleaner, I guess. Um, let's see. We have an auto body department. I'm thinking about collaboration. Okay, these are all comments. Okay. Uh, any hands up? I don't see any hands. Okay. All right, so I'll carry on with this. Over on the left side here, we have, uh, this is the other radar sensor, uh, the, uh, the Denso sensor. And it's uh, one degree to the left, and it is 1.6 um, meters away. And then over on the right here, we're showing um, the actual energy being returned. So here I'm mousing over that. That's 104 dB, 114 dB. So that's that's the one that's closer. That's the uh, the smaller trihedral. But the larger trihedral, which is further away, um, it has essentially the same radar return because it's got a larger surface and it's able to return that that same amount of energy. The other thing to note here is that this green trace going across the bottom, this is what's called a noise profile. So it's looking at the the area the, or the scene that it's actually having to deal with. And this is some of the um, information, of course, the system has to adjust for. Uh, when you are doing some calibration work, and I believe it's on uh, Hondas and maybe even some Toyotas, they, they specifically tell you that you must have a uh, five meter or maybe about a 10 meter open area without any heavy dense objects. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to minimize that, uh, that noise profile from the scene as you stand up that static, uh, calibration, uh, piece, right? So that, so that it understands, um, here's the noise profile and here is, here's what's going on. I have found with, uh, Mazda, we've done a lot of experimenting. We've actually put multiple targets in the in the scene and they will give you failure code. So it'll say it can't calibrate, but they'll also give you a little number. And if you take that number and go in the service information, you can see uh, some of the indications of what might be happening. Uh, for instance, too, too many uh, multiple targets detected or uh, see, you know, the things not not aligned properly or what have you. So 
um, some good experiments for technicians or students to uh, work with so that they can understand a little bit more. Because when, when you're doing this calibration work, you, you hit a button and it fails. And, and it's like, well, what, what, why did it fail? And some cars don't tell you why. They just, they just say, hey, un, unable to calibrate. And now you got to go out and figure it out. So I think uh, some of these visual tools will actually help uh, the students um, gain a little more perspective on, on what, uh, what's happening. Okay. Um, looking for more questions here. Okay, I think we're good. All right. So here is a, um, here's a video. Tesla actually released this video um, earlier this year, I believe. And this, this has got information overload. And it's, it's uh, pretty awesome. You can go out on the internet and, and uh, get access to it. But as we're going uh, down the road here, we're, we're, it's using all of this, its perception systems to figure out um, you know, what's going, what, what the world around it looks like. And if you watch this uh, top, uh, this stuff on the left side here, it's starting to add, um, add it, you know, information about hey, wh what environment am I entering into? And it's uh, pretty interesting. So as you go along here, it sees where the stop sign is, stop line, and then this is driving around in a little city. There's a lot going on there. It's uh, pretty cool stuff. So here is, um, again, this is uh, the guy I mentioned earlier that uh, is, is a white hat hacker. He uh, posted this up um, earlier this year and this happened to his car. And as he was driving down the highway, um, you know, you see in the lower right, he's going 80 miles an hour and you're going to see where this vehicle slows down, uh, to 70 miles an hour pretty rapidly. And, uh, we'll see why it's doing that. But, um, this video is not super high res, but you can see over here on the left, this bounding box around the vehicle. And these other boxes here have, um, information about what it is, where it's at. It's in the lane, left lane. Um, I'm trying to read some of this moving, uh, it gives like a velocity number, um, and the distance away and, and so on, but we'll play this through. And you see it slowing down there. Boom. It just had a, it had a major episode there. So what, what actually happened there? This is what happened. It saw the bridge, uh, the shadows under this bridge, and it just started saying, hey, there's an object, there's an object. And it had a sensory overload and it said, oh my God, there's something going on. But you know, to the human eye, there wasn't anything really going on there, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's incredible that these systems, you know, they're out in the wild now and there's gonna be bizarre things that are happening with these, these vehicles. You know, the, the driver is ultimately responsible for the safe operation of the vehicle, even with a high featured vehicle like this, and they have to be ready to take over at any time or, or respond at any time. Um, I have had this situation happen to me, not for, from the bridge uh, so much, but from uh, the, the car actually detecting a car in the adjacent lane, and it thinks it's going to cut in. And it just says, oh, that car is not going any further. And, I, and if I'm going faster, and that car just all of a sudden just decides to check up right at that vehicle and I have vehicles in back of me and I'm not paying attention, the, the vehicle in back of me could easily pile into me. So I think that there's probably gonna be um, a, a real need for drivers to become highly educated on how these systems are interacting with the vehicle behavior uh, because this is not your, this is not a regular vehicle. This is, this is uh, this technology is just absolutely over, um, this is some new, new cool stuff. So this is another, uh, another thing to look at on the video, on the, um, the radar stuff. Um, we have what's called Doppler, right? So we need to know what the rate of change is, 
um, so that it can understand, hey, how close am I getting to this? Am I gonna am I gonna hit this uh, this vehicle or this uh, this this car whatever? So trying to explain what Doppler is and Doppler is a change um, is kind of hard sometimes. But this is part of that video that I did, and it shows um, what the Doppler scene um, looks like, and you'll see. Uh, these these are not these are objects that it's detecting, but they're not moving. Okay, nothing's moving here, but it will see if if things are gaining in distance away from the sensor. You'll see them out here, and then you'll see them actually growing right the time, and how much rate of change. And then that, that when they come down here, you're going to see them actually getting closer. So I've got this is a video, with, and you'll see me in the lower right there, and. Um, and I'm just going to start backing up, and you see it's tracking me. And then as soon as I stop moving, boom, we're on the, the zero line, and then we move forward. Then I'm going to move a little bit faster. You see the rate of change. And again, that's what these systems, you know, the, the systems are using to, to figure out, hey, when is this crash going to happen, and what do I need to do? Do I need to pre-fill the brakes? Do I need to start applying the brakes? Uh, when do I need to warn? Uh, and so on. And so this is, uh, again, another visual indicator to help, uh, help further illustrate what, uh, what, these, what these systems are doing. Um, you can pull up, a, usually you can see a, on a scan tool sp uh, PID, uh, you'll see a distance um, indicator uh, that you can look at. Uh, sometimes they may have rate of change. Um, the PIDs are sometimes named differently depending on what the manufacturer is. Uh, but this might be some good stuff to actually graph and, and you know, maybe if you're in a road testing, a road test type environment um, to kind of show the technicians uh, what's going on. But these sensors are not just tracking one item. They're tracking multiple items. And they've got to be able to differentiate between a stationary object and uh, a moving object. And this is where, you know, people think that the radar sensor is going to help them from hitting a a parked vehicle. Sometimes they're ignoring parked vehicles. Uh, so this is um, this is the world that we're living in, right? Uh, this this stuff is very complex, and it's uh, we're 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 currently trying to figure out what's really going on in real time and learning every day. Uh, let's see. So Tom Tom has a question here. Have you thought about putting together a package of all this technology that could be offered and sold to schools? Yes, uh, we do. Um, we've actually, uh, with uh, AES Wave, we've already um, started talking about putting this together. If we have enough demand, sure, we, we would like to put some kits together and, um, and then we could we can ship them to you and then perhaps uh, provide some, some training or setup or what have you. Um, you know, the, the, set, the parts are, are cheap. There's a lot of setup time. I've burnt a lot of time up uh, learning all this stuff and this is, some of, this is how I've learned. Uh, learning by doing, right? So um, you may want a blend of, of things that you, maybe some of this you want to put together yourself or maybe you want to just order a package. Uh, I know teachers are um, overtaxed as, as, as it is with time. So um, uh, yeah, well, we, we definitely want to help support our, um, our, our schools out there. So this is, this is actually the radar sensor that we're using, the AWR1642 Boost. And so let me pull it over here. Uh, unplug it. So you just have a micro USB um, cable. This is the board right here. And uh, you've got a You've got a power supply here, and then there's a micro USB right there, and then this little cheap stand comes with it, and you can just move the thing around and um, and set it up. Pretty pretty cool. So this thing is only three hundred bucks uh, for that for that piece, um, and I think I. You'll have to look. I, I, some of this stuff did not come with power supply, so you had to get your own power supply for it. Um, but you know that's that's not uh, not terribly expensive. So let's talk a little bit about ultrasonics. Um, 
Ultrasonic sensors are they're, they're similar to radar sensors. You know, they, they put out these little chirps. Uh, they are in a high frequency range. Um, one of the easiest way to diagnose these things is to actually just put on a stethoscope with just the hose on the end of it and make sure the car, these things may not be active unless you're in reverse or in drive. Um, and then just go over, you can put that right over the, uh, the sensor and actually hear it chirping. Um, but the, here is, I'm using a thermal camera, a thermal imager, and I have used a thermal imager to actually diagnose a car that had a, had a code for a sensor that wasn't working. And I was able to basically put the car in drive or key on engine off in drive and uh, went to the front of the car and I could see them all lit up and I listened to the one that it was filing uh, a complaint on and it, I heard, heard no noise. <clears throat> so there I knew I had power to it. The thing was actually powered up. It was producing heat, but uh, the sensor wasn't outputting anything. So that one came from a collision center and had repair done to it. So it either had the signal wire was broken or the sensor itself was damaged. But you know, this, is, this gives the, the technician some perspective. But the other way you can check it is with the lab scope. So this is a good uh, fundamental way to actually use the lab scope to actually go right over the sensor and see what it's actually outputting. Um, and you need a probe for that, of course. And here AES Wave has a specific probe just for the ultrasonic parking sensor. It's 28 bucks. So a pretty cool little device to, uh, to add. Um, you know, I, I would say that it, yes, it's, it's nice to have. It's good for uh, illustration, but your, your quick and dirty diagnostics on that are going to be your stethoscope and, um, you know, making sure that there's power to it um, and, uh, and away you go. All right, so that's, that's the end of my demonstration on some of the visual stuff. I do have a camera calibration uh, case study here that I want to go through. And, um, and show you what I found. I, th I thought it was pretty interesting. So uh, this is a 2018 Lexus. Um, I can't remember the, uh, the model, but it was, you know, it's a sedan. And so we do a pre-scan and we're using an aftermarket scan tool to do this particular uh, uh, process, but I do have some OEM tools uh, to do some comparative on. So we do a full health check. That's normally what you want to do. You want to scan all the modules, make sure there are no faults in any of them. Uh, the other thing you typically want to do before you do any calibration is go into the scan tool and look at the initial adjustment values and actually make note of those. So we did that with the scan tool. Uh, just for this exercise, I decided to connect to TechStream and do, a, do the same measurement just to make sure I'm getting the right, uh, right data and I'm getting the identical uh, service information. Um, this is the uh, factory service information process, the calibration process, and, and Rick may be aware of this, uh, but every Toyota or Lexus that goes down the assembly line that has a camera system on it, a uh, forward-facing lane type camera, uh, goes through what's, what's called a, a one-time recognition. So it has the target that has three different pieces, and it gets basically dropped right down in front of the car. It's right about uh, at the bumper. And it, it takes about a minute, or it's probably less than a minute. And bam, it does a calibration, and then it goes down the road, or down the, the assembly line. So the software for operating this one-time recognition actually is resident in the vehicle. But if you look at the OEM process here, that software for this particular car is not available. Um, so you have to do what's called the sequential recognition, which is very time consuming. You have to move that target. Uh, you have to basically mark the floor up and set up a target in three positions at three different times. And you're hitting the scan tool to go do this. And um, it's, it takes a, it's, it's quite laborious. So this one time recognition though, I mean, that's how the car is calibrated from the factory. Uh, some of the aftermarket tooling out there will allow you to do the one-time recognition in lieu of the, the, the three part, um, which will save you a ton of time. So here, uh, here we're walking through the calibration and we're giving it a reason why we're doing the cal cal calibration. And then on this particular application, this is the Autel system. They tell you which, which uh, process are you gonna use, uh, A or B. So we have, we have both. So in this case, we just picked A and then it, it walks you through the setup 
one of the other things I found interesting is that even reading the OEM uh, information, uh, and, and at times I've seen it on other manufacturers, they ask you, what is the height of the camera? So you, you measure where the height of the camera is. Well, it, service information is usually just asking you, put in this value. They give you the value to put in. And it's usually you don't change it because that's, that's what's in it. But every one of these that I've measured, the car has actually settled, you know, maybe a quarter of an inch or a half inch or maybe more. Uh, so I, I put in the actual value because you're ax asked where the, where the lateral position is, where the uh, installation is, and then you go into also where is the target located. So all of those things are important so that you are establishing uh, calibration points. I've asked some folks that I know at uh, some of these OEMs, and uh, they uh, they tell me that um, they can't get an answer to this kind of stuff. They just say, do what the book says. So anyways, there we, we measured it. Um, it's actually about 50.4 inches or so uh, where the, the books or the system is, or I'm sorry, 50, it's about 50.25. And this is showing it's 50.42, closer to a half inch. So we adjust that and then um, we do the calibration and then this is the video right here. Now adjusting and uh-oh, uh-oh is right. It says the function performed failed. Confirm the following conditions. Turn the engine power switch on, engine off, ready off. Do you want to try again? So yeah, I hit it a couple of times and, and it failed. Uh, so now I got to figure out what what happened. And when I first did my initial inspection on this car, I, I had a suspicion that there was something going on with it. So you look at the screen, it says visit your dealer, of course, to the, uh, to the owner. Um, there's that one-time recognition thing set up. So I looked at this thing and, you know, normally you want to make sure the windshield is completely clean. Um, and in this case here, I, when I looked at this, I go, wow, that's weird. It looks like there's a fog or something on the inside of the windshield because we, we cleaned it. And sure enough, um, there was a fog and it was causing a problem. So we dropped the camera out of that thing and we look and look at that, um, look at that image. I think that somebody was driving, whoever was using this car may have been using, may have been smoking or may have been vaping uh, because this stuff was like greasy stuff. And this is a 2018 vehicle and it it only had uh i think less than thirty thousand miles on it and and it and it had gotten into a collision and i mean it's amazing so we cleaned it all off popped it back together hit the button and the calibration was done uh just like that so um this car when i drove it before we did the calibration um it it had trouble picking up lane lines when I got all done with it, I thought it would be greatly improved. It seemed to behave exactly the same. Um, again, these systems don't always really work very well. And I'm, I'm comparing that to the way that the Tesla behaves. And the Tesla is pretty, uh, pretty rock solid. So there's our after. This is what you want to normally do. When you're done, you want to see what, your, what kind of offset was applied um, to your calibration versus where you, you started. And then this is the kind of stuff that um, you, you want to check, you want to make sure that you do like a screenshot and you attach it to the, to the work order as you're going through this process so that you are creating a story about what, what you actually did, the steps that you've, you did and where you ended up. Because if you ended up with some big, big number, big delta there, there might be something wrong. You may have done something wrong and you, you want to make sure that you're not deviating too far. Uh, and then this is the, uh, the, after you do a clear code and you do a road test and then you run a full on report. And with this particular software, it's pretty nice because it's now, it's doing the pre-scan and the post-scan, it's putting it all together for you. Um, and along with what you did. And you can take a picture along the way too, or multiple pictures. And it asked you what, you know, it's asking you for the reason why you were there and what you did. Um, and, uh, and then creates the creates the, uh, the story. So, all right. So I'm going to, um, can I unmute everybody simultaneously or anybody have any questions? Q and a time. Uh, 
Yeah, go ahead. Um, I asked about uh, measuring that camera height because it's inside the car. What's an accurate measurement on that? Okay. I didn't. I do have a screen showing how I measured that right there. So I've got a laser. Yeah, I've got a, a ruler, but you just, do you see the uh, green line right there? The green laser? Yeah. So I've got a, uh, I've got a, a level. With that ruler. I've got a level setting on a tripod that I basically just dial up so that it's basically cutting a line through the, the camera lens right in the center. Okay. Right, right in the center, okay. And then, um, and then I just put the tape measure to do the measurement on where, where that height is. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see if I have a picture of this. Well, maybe. Let's see. Okay. Do you see the? Um, there's my there's my laser device. So it's a two-way laser, and I've got it on a tripod that I can adjust the height on it, and um, and so I just adjust the height of it so that it's pulling a, putting a line right across the center of the lens okay. to measure Thank that. You. Okay. I have a question. Yep. Um, the case to me, did you uh, happen to uh, without adjusting the height of the vehicle? Say that, say that question one more time. Well, you changed the camera height. Yes. Yeah, I um, I if I wanted to get scientific, I probably I, I should have spent a lot more time doing it, but um, to see what that delta was, so so. Uh, yeah, I, I I unmuted people so. Uh, You've got your hand up. Let's see. Somebody's got their hand up. I can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Um, so what I usually train on are Mazdas, Toyotas, and um, Hondas. They they all require static calibration, or most of them require static calibration, uh, and they're pretty popular. They're they're, they're cars that uh, students are likely going to run into. So um, I I am always renting, you know, renting from uh, national uh, Nissan Altima. Um, Usually on the Nissan Altimas, look for the ones that have the sunroof, and they will usually have camera and radar. Those are kind of the higher level. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and one, you know, Toyota. yep, Mazdas and Toyotas. And, and one of the th other good exercises for students is to maybe start walking around cars and trying to identify what equipment is likely on that car, because usually you can see where the cameras are at. Usually the front uh, logos, uh, the front, uh, you know, mark logo has a different texture to it. It's it's not three dimensional. It's just a flat, uh, translucent type uh, setup, and that usually is indicative of a radar sensor. Um, I, have a, I have another question for you. This yes. Uh, about these calibrations and uh, these radar sensors. Is this something that's going to be on like Mitchell One, like a third? Uh, no, most of the uh, aftermarket resources have the OEM data. Um, the one that, that I usually have success with, uh, especially when I'm renting brand new cars, because we get 2020 cars when we're doing classes, uh, I go to All Data. All Data usually has the stuff 
um, already in their system, where the other the other manufacturers or suppliers are usually six to twelve months behind uh, in getting the the current model year vehicles populated. Yeah. This is a this is a class. No, we're uh, I'm I'm I own a workshop here in in Claremont, and um, I'm partnering with uh, AES Wave. And when they sell the equipment, um, we we bring their students down to the shop uh, on a Saturday, and they they provide transportation and, and housing and food and stuff for them. We spend all day. We do we go through a syllabus and then we do a lot of hands-on calibration. Um, for, for one day to get these guys up to speed with uh, with calibration. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm on social media, so uh, you can look me up. Okay, do you mind if I do that? You guys, um, definitely. Or do you have your email? Jenny did this um, presentation. I just didn't catch it. Yeah, it's a, it's actually at the end. We didn't get to that screen yet. Sorry. Okay, sorry. That's okay. okay. Um, and I'm gonna post a. Yeah, I'm gonna post a link to the um, to the. Uh, the PDF for this presentation. Um, it is password protected, and um, the password is this high security password that you use to get into this conference today. Okay. Um, I just want to leave one uh, one little bit of info. Diagnostic Network is a uh, platform that uh, that I started a couple years ago. Um, it's like anything. You need to add uh, a, a stream of data to your feed to your knowledge you know it's like reading the newspaper uh this is a good place for you to um look at once in a while and look at all the adas related type stuff because you know as you move forward you're going to run into you're going to start discovering weird things that are happening and then what we do in addition to the training is that we provide continued support we have a special area just for the aes customers to share knowledge and information and keep a, each of us up to date with, um, with things as they progress. And then there's my contact info. And... It should be, oh, just go full screen on the video. Yeah, go full screen on the video. That's because my video is what I'm how I'm sharing the the presentation. And uh, let me I'm going to post this link here. For the students and then uh, let's see, it's in a Dropbox folder. I'm going to see who's, uh, I'm going to keep making noise so that I'm staying on top, okay? <laughs> uh, Danny Tan, let's make him, let's mute him. Uh, yeah, there we go, okay. All right, I am uh, putting a link. There's a link right there in the uh, chat. That is a link to the PDF for this class. Then just use that cat fall 2020 um, 
with a capital C, and you guys should be able to open that up. Um, Paul Brow says, can we get flex credit for the session? I'm not sure what that means. Anybody know? Paul? So, um, as far as I know, Kat will be following up with some certificates. I'm not sure how Wendy is um, keeping track, but um, I know that our Kat's goal is to send out you know, certificates showing that you got credit or you attended, so you can apply for that for your AFD Educational Foundation training. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, any other, so the password for the link is cat, Paul, I'm typing that in there too. Some, somebody asked for that, Raj, okay. Um, cat fall 2020. All right. Uh, any other questions? I don't see any. So how do I close this, uh, session? Tom, or I guess I just leave, right? 